We are the first people of Northern LA County. It is difficult for us to attain higher education. Here are a few who have. We are often invisible in our own homelands. Although we were supposed to be erased, we are still here. We are inspired through education and the growth of our communities. Thriving, proud, and resilient. We ask that you uplift our narrative and empower our voices in the work that you do and beyond. Amanat, Lutawan, Dennis Garcia, Asekpa, Yuka Chain. In my in my Tataviam language, that is uh, hello. <laughs> my name is Dennis Garcia. I am from the San Fernando Valley. I also part of my culture is also the, the Shumash culture. I'm still learning more and more about my Tataviam culture, but I um, know more about my Shumash culture and. That is what I took on first when I first started getting back. But well, right now I'd like to uh, do a blessing in the Tataviam way, okay? So I'm going I'm to name the four directions. Oho Tuvume, to the north. Oho Tuvume. To the east, Koimi. To the south, Kitame. And to the west, Ba'aime. Oh, we bring in the spirits of the four directions. Like I said, um, I know more about my Chumash culture. Um, I started uh, late in life. I started when I was 40 years old. Even though I knew through my grandma who I was that we were native people, she always told me that. No matter what anybody tells you, we are of mixed blood, but we are people have been here for many, many, many years, for thousands of years. So never ever forget who you are. We are indigenous to this land. So I take that, you know, my grandmother is being a big influence on me as, if, as to the point of where I am right now in my life, because if it wasn't for her, I, I don't think I'd have the identity that I have and the connection that I have with my culture. There were many, there were many, many mentors who, uh, once I was, I started to come to a point in my life where I was able to meet up with other people, different elders, and uh, and go different places and learn about the California people. That I started, like I said, I was 40 years old. So, um, one of my uh, biggest mentors who took me everywhere is a man named Charlie Cook, and uh, so. He introduced me to many, many different people, to some elders, to some uh, people that were younger than me, but had been involved in the culture a long, long time. So they knew they actually lived the culture longer than you know than I have been living the culture. I am also, I guess, I'm, I'm an elder, and I'm also a traditional Shumash dancer. So uh, th those are the things that um, that I have learned along the way, with the help of many, many, many people who have encouraged me to go out. And, and find who out, out who I am, because if, if we don't, the elders don't learn, and we don't have people to teach the younger ones, that some of these things are going to be lost forever. Our stories, you know, our songs, and uh, the things like that. So uh, with that, um, uh, if I if my dad was here today, we called him Pops, and out of respect to him, we would say, Pops, which story would you like to hear? And this is the story that he would ask. A long, long time ago, and this is a, a Shumash story, in a place that you know as Malibu, we call Humalewo. The people of the village awoke from their homes, their ops, 
And as they did, they came out of those homes. It was a time of the year when the sun should be shining brightly. But it was total darkness. The only light came from the fires in the village. Well, they try to go about their day's work. The children try to go about learning how their, their hunting skills and their fishing skills. But once they left the village, it was total darkness. They couldn't see anything. They couldn't do anything. So they came back into the village and they rested till it was time to go to bed. And they went to bed back in their homes and then they awoke the next day. And as they, when they awoke the next day, the same thing happened. There was still total darkness. So the people didn't know what to do. They got together in, the, in, their, in their groups and their families and they prayed. And they prayed that the sun would come back to the people. Well, this went on for seven days. And no matter how much the people prayed, it was still total darkness. There was no sun. The elders, they were kind of sad because even though they were warm inside their ops, they liked to sit in the sunlight and warm their bones. The children were getting restless because they couldn't practice their hunting skills or go out to the ocean to fish. Some of the food was becoming scarce, the food that they gathered. They were running low on. So they're getting a little worried about this. So the chiefs of the village got together, the families, and they sat in council. And in our culture, we're matriarchal. So the women have a lot of power. There are men and women chiefs, and there are different levels of chiefs, ceremonial chiefs and things, but, and then people who make the decisions. So they got together the chiefs of the village, the families in the village, and they said, what are we going to do? The sun hasn't come to us for seven days. And as they said in council, they came up with an idea. They said, let's get together about 12 of our best warriors and see if they can bring back the sun to the Shumash people. And warriors, we didn't fight with many people here in the beginning. Some of our warriors were great craftsmen. They were great canoe makers or they were great bead makers or jewelry makers. So they were considered warriors. We had men and women chiefs, we had men and women warriors. So we gathered up those 12 warriors. We told them, you have to go bring back the sun to the Shumash people. So they kissed their families goodbye and they left the village and they disappeared into the darkness. Well, an eighth day, a ninth day, a tenth day passed. Still no sun. Still total darkness. Like I said, everyone's getting restless because there was no sun. On the morning of the tenth day, an elder comes out of the darkness and into the village. And he approaches the people. And they approached him and they said, What do you want with this old man? With him he had this warrior who stood about this tall. He said, I brought my warrior here to bring the sun back to the Shumash people. Well, they kind of chuckled because this warrior was just as tall. But having nothing to lose, their warriors hadn't brought back the sun to them yet. They agreed and they brought the man into the, into the, uh, the circle, into the village. And as when he did, when he brought him into the village, he brought his warrior in with him and he started to sing. Yani yani ho ho yehui o yeh yani yani ho ho yehui o and the warrior danced in the circle. Well, the warrior started to dance faster, so the elder sang faster. Yani yani ho ho yehui o yeh yani yani ho ho yehui o. Well, the warrior danced even faster yet, so the elder sang faster. Yani yani ho ho yehui o yeh yani yani ho ho yehui o. And as the warrior danced in the circle, he spread his arms out like this. And as he did that, feathers started to cover his arms and then part of his body till eventually his whole body was covered with feathers. Well, the warrior danced a couple more times in the circle and then he took flight and he disappeared into the darkness. On the 11th day, the 12th day, 13th day passed, still no sun. No matter how much they prayed, the sun was not coming back to the people. 
On the morning of the 14th day, as they came out of their homes, their ops, in hopes of seeing something, they looked up. And as they looked up into the sky, they could see from the east a little glimmer of light. Eventually, more light started to appear in the sky. So eventually they saw part of the sun raise above the mountains. Till eventually the whole sun was above the mountains. And as they looked even closer, they saw those 12 warriors that they had sent out to bring back the sun to the people. And they came back over the mountains and into the village and their families were very, very happy. They greeted and hugged and kissed them because they were glad they came back safely. Well, the sun wasn't rising too much anymore. It was just moving back and forth over the mountains back and forth and as they looked close they saw that warrior that had turned into that bird and the sun was setting on his tail like this well eventually he took the sun up into the sky and he dropped it off into the sky and then he came and he flew back down into the village well the people were very curious they had many many questions for him so they said you know what what happened out there? What ha what's, what's going on? What did the sun? Did the sun say anything? Did he give you any, any messages for us? And he just kind of said yes. Well, what did the sun say? He said, well, the first thing he said is never take anything for granted because you never know when that sun's going to come up in the sky. And more questions kept coming at him. He couldn't answer them fast enough. And then he said, did he say anything else? The people said to the, the warrior. And the warrior said, yes. Just because someone is small in stature doesn't determine his strength because his strength comes from within. And the more and more questions kept coming at him until eventually he just said, he turned around and he showed him his tail feathers. And he said, where the sun shone so brightly on my tail, he left at this beautiful red. And then he showed him this black mark those feathers. That's where the sun actually touched my feathers and left that black mark across those red feathers. And that's the day that the red tail hawk was created and he brought back the sun to the Chumash people. Aho. Okay, in honor of that uh, warrior bird that brought back the sun to the Chumash people, I we sing a song, the red tail hawk song, and it goes like this. Atasun helik, atasun helik, ha ku te halen. Atasun helik, atasun helik, ha ku te halen. Ataka pa wo chilek, achoho wo chun, achoho wo chun. Ayawa ya waki wanawa, ayawa ya waki wanawa. A tessun helik, a tessun helik, ha ku te halen. A tessun helik, a tessun helik, ha ku te halen. A taka pa ho chilek, a choho wo chun, a choho wo chun. A yawa ya waki wanawa, a yawa ya waki wanawa. A tessun helik. A tessun helik, ha ku te halen. A tessun helik, a tessun helik, ha ku te halen. A taka pa ho chilek, a choho wo chun, a choho wo chun. A yawa ya waki wanawa, a yawa ya waki wanawa. A tessun helik, a tessun helik. Ha ku te halen, a tessun helik, a tessun helik. Ha ku te halen, a taka pa ho chilek, a choho wo chun, a choho wo chun. A yawa ya waki wanawa, a yawa ya waki wanawa. A tessun helik, a tessun helik. Ha ku te halen Aho hili Well, um, I hope you enjoyed the song and the story. Uh, this is just a little part of uh, my journey on my, on my way to get to where I am as an elder and 
and the things that I've done through my culture throughout the years. So, like I said, I get, once again, I hope you enjoyed the story and the song, and uh, uh, thank you for letting me do this. I hope. I hope. This song is a contemporary song. It was uh, written by Liz Dominguez. Liz Dominguez, when uh, they made California Adventures, uh, Disney asked. They they got a lot of uh, Chumash people, Native people, to come to film a, a, a short segment in their IMAX theater. You know about the the history of California, from the Indian people to the Chinese. That you know different. Uh, cultures of people that made America or, or made California what it is today. Uh, you know, probably America because they had Indian people in it, they had the Chinese and how it progressed from there. So uh, she was asked to write a song about, you know, about that would go into, into the film which never made it. So she wrote this song, it's called Kayawawa Lele. Uh, part of the song is Shoop wish toyo ki paka and that paka paka is, is Spanish because she didn't have any Chumash words for that part of the song but is that uh, we stand together under the air under the rainbow in the spirit of the dolphin uh, so uh, Alakoy is dolphin so uh, she wrote this song, and uh, we always try to remember she's passed. She's been gone for probably 10 years or so. And uh, so we try, I always mention that she was the one responsible for this song. So I'm going to sing it for you this evening. Kayawawa lele, kayawawa lele, kayawawa lele, kayawawa lele. Shoop with soyo ki paka, shoop with soyo ki paka. Kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele. Ka ha Kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele. Shoop with soyo ki paka, shoop with soyo ki paka. 
Kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa la lele, ka ha sha lu ko ko la, ka ha sha lu ko ko la, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, chu pu sto yo pi pa ka. Chu pu sto yo pi pa ka. Kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, ka ha sha lu ko ko la. Ka ha sha lu ko ko la. Kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele. Chu pu sto yo pi pa ka. Chu pu sto yo pi pa ka. Kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele. Ka ha sha lu ko ko la. Ka ha sha lu ko ko la. Kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele. Kayo wa wa lele, kayo wa wa lele. Ho. We, my brother and I, we've always done a, an owl song with this. So, but it's uh, Yama Kwiti. Kwiti is a is a burrowing owl. It's it's on the ground, so it's not really. A, we haven't figured out a song for Muhu, but this is just this is still an owl song. Hu Yama Kwiti, Yama Kwiti, Hey Yama Kwiti Owe, Hey Yama Kwiti. Hey, I'm a quitty away. 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 Hoo! Hoo! I'm a quitty. Hey, I'm a quitty away. Hey, I'm a quitty. Hey, I'm a quitty away. 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 Hoo! Hey, I'm a quitty. Hey, I'm a quitty. I'm a quitty. Hey, I'm a quitty away. 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 Hey, I'm a quitty. Hey, I'm a quitty. Hey, I'm a quitty away. Hey, I'm a quitty. Hey, I'm a quitty away. 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 I am a quitty. Hey, I'm a quitty away. I am a quitty. Hey, I'm a quitty away. 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 Hoo! And that's that's kind of like a, a owl song because I learned it. It was you know, I'm a quitty, and sang really slow and kind of nice. Well, then I've also heard it as a bear song, so it kind of fits, you know. Owl and bear because the bear da- the the bear dancers say, "Yama kuiri, yama 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 kuiri." Right? Oh, yama kuiri. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of sung. So. To me, when I heard it, it was a song, and I said, I don't like it like that. So I talked my brother into just singing it a different way. And uh, but it, to me, after after learning that, I said, well, there's kind of an owl song and a bear song at the same time. So, Aku, I'm not net the one Alan Salazar, Chigoyanga, Tapu, Nikasin. Hello, I'm Alan Salazar. Uh, my indigenous ancestors come from the village of Chigoyanga, which is a Tutabiam village in Santa Clarita, uh, and the Shumash village of Tapu, uh, which is in Tapu Canyon, Simi Valley. Uh, today I want to talk to you about 
uh, uh, the Tamils, uh, the maritime culture of the Shumash people. Uh, I want to give you a brief history. Uh, uh, our, our Tamils, our plank canoes are very unique uh, and there are only two tribes that we know of on the whole west coast that built plank canoes. Uh, so a brief history of, of, of the Shumash uh, Tamil and our maritime culture. Uh, the Shumash are one of the oldest tribes in America as we know. We've been here uh, 13,000 years at least. Uh, I've only been here for part of them. Uh, but uh, uh, during those 13,000 years, uh, we would build canoes and rafts and go from the mainland along the coast here of Santa Barbara, Carpinterias, Ventura, Malibu, and, and even farther north, and paddle out to the islands, which were also Shumash. Now, 13,000 years ago, that was all one island called Santa Rosé, uh, and our coastline was about three to five miles farther out. So it was a relatively short journey, depending on where you left from, to go out to the islands, maybe four, five, six miles. So a small Thule reed canoe can make that uh, very easily. But then about 8,000 years ago, our, our waters warmed up and the ocean levels raised up and our coastline moved back to where it is today. It took several hundred years for this to happen. And uh, that one giant island became Anacapa, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, and San Miguel Island. And when it became farther out, uh, at some point, we came up with the technology of building bigger uh, tamoles. Tamol is the Shumash word for canoe. Uh, so we, we came up with the technology of building plank canoes. Now, we didn't have Lowe's and, and, and Home Depot back then, so uh, our, our canoe builders had to, had to first start by making their own boards. So they would get driftwood, which had cured as it had been in the, in, the, in the ocean waters, redwood from Northern California, that would float down, uh, down current, uh, down the coast, uh, was the preferred wood. But any soft wood would, would work. And basically we, we made our own one by six, one by eights, two by tens, two by twelves, uh, and then drilled holes in them and glued and tied them together using the natural tar and uh, asphaltum uh, that, that seeps up uh, uh, throughout all of uh, various locations uh, in California. Carpinteria is a natural oil seep uh, and, and at to, to today it still has a lot of tar and asphaltum that you can go and collect. And we would mix that tar and asphaltum uh, with pine pitch, uh, so it's called yoke, uh, and we would glue and tie our, our, our canoes together. So by coming up with a board technology, if you get two 12-foot boards, you have the beginning of a 24-foot canoe. If you have two 16-foot long uh, boards, you have the beginnings of a 32-foot canoe. And the Spanish say when they first came down the coast in the 1500s that uh, uh, they were greeted by, by dozens and dozens of Shumash Tamals when they came to our villages. And uh, the canoes were 20 feet, some 30 feet, some even over 40 feet long with 10, 12 people in them. Uh, they're flat bottom, so they carry a lot of weight. So the way I, I try to explain it is, is basically our, our canoes were used to go out and, and fish and to not bring back just a few fish, but to bring back three, four, five hundred pounds of fish to feed everyone in the village. Uh, uh, so they carry great amounts of weight that allowed us also to take, for example, deer skins and deer meat and, and deer hides uh, out to our, our family and friends, Shumash family and friends on, on the islands. And we could take three, four hundred pounds of trade items uh, out to the islands and then bring back the shell bead money or the uh, abalone shells that they had in abundance. Uh, so archeologists and anthropologists, uh, uh, they believe that, that the Shumash have been building these tumuls for around 3,000 years. I believe we started building them shortly after uh, the ocean waters raised and that we've probably been building them for, for 6,000 years, but uh, that's all kind of an educated guess. Uh, and then what happened was, uh, when the mission uh, started and, and the Spanish came, uh, it dramatically affected uh, all tribal people in California. And it dramatically affected uh, the Shumash. Our population was cut in half, uh, so our workforce was cut in half. Uh, we were enslaved at the missions, and we were uh, uh, forced to learn uh, other trades, other skills to survive. So somewhere around the 1830s, 
uh, the old men that were the Brotherhood of the Tamal, and the brother, Brotherhood of the Tamal are the men that build the canoes and paddle in them, and are, they are the fishermen. Uh, if you owned a Tamal, you were a wealthy, influential uh, man within the Chumash uh, culture. Uh, but by the 1830s, we realized our young people were not learning the skills to be master canoe builders. And uh, they were learning uh, how to survive. They were farm workers, ranch hands, uh, blacksmiths, cooks, maids, uh, uh, and uh, those sort of skills. Uh, so by definitely by 1840, we stopped building our tamoles. And then in the early 1900s, there was a vast interest in the beginning of a revitalization of our maritime culture. And this, the, the timeline for that is, in 1912, Fernando Labrado, a very respected Chumash elder who knew the languages, uh, 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 not just one Chumash language, but several dialects, uh, he knew the, the story and the history. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, and he came from a background where uh, his father, his grandfather, uh, his, his great uncles uh, were canoe builders. And he'd seen the traditional tamoles uh, being built in the traditional way. And in 1912, here in Santa Barbara, he built uh, a plank canoe mostly as a demonstration to show how, how we took the boards, how they were glued and tied together. Uh, and from his notes, from his drawings, all of the Tamils in modern times have used his notes and his drawings. So we try as, as best as possible today to build our Tamils in the spirit of our ancestors. Uh, they're not replicas, they are working Tamils. The first one built in historic time uh, was the Halek, and I hope to, uh, 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 that we can show you the Halek a little bit later in, in, in the video. Uh, but the Halek was built in, uh, uh, for the 1976 bicentennial by the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. It was taken on a large support boat out to uh, Santa Cruz Island, the island that the Chumash called Limu, and some Chumash men paddled uh, around the island. Then they took it over to Santa Rosa, and they paddled around Santa Rosa. Uh, I'm not sure if they paddled from, from uh, Santa Cruz to Santa Rosa, but they did some paddling around the islands. And then it was brought back, uh, and it was brought here to the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, and it's currently at Fleshman uh, Auditorium here. Uh, so it was used for one summer. Never made a crossing from the mainland out to any of the islands. Uh, and then in 1997, uh, uh, I, along with a group of other Chumash people, was, were approached by the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum and the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History uh, to build uh, actually three tamoles, uh, one for the local school districts here, the uh, 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 Santa Barbara County of Office of Education and their Indian Ed Department, and uh, one for the Maritime Museum and one for the Chumash community. Uh, so I helped build Eloyun, and Eloyun is the Chumash word for swordfish. And uh, in 1997, we built Eloyun. Since then, we've built uh, several more tamoles. And in 2001, we paddled from the mainland, uh, Channel Islands Harbor in Oshnari, California, uh, out to Limu. We left at 3.45 in the morning. And uh, I want to thank the Hawks for coming by and visiting us right now. They're, they're a little squawking, a little noisy. Uh, you can hear the ravens and the, and the crows and the, and, and the acorn woodpeckers. Uh, it, it, it's so great to hear, hear them. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, late spring and, and they're very active. Um, but in 1997, we built a 24-foot flat bottom tamal. Uh, and we started practicing relearning those skills, how, how to paddle, how to navigate. Um, and for three years, uh, uh, for four years, we, we practiced. Uh, and uh, we progressively got stronger as paddlers and more knowledgeable of, of, of how our canoes work. Uh, flat bottom canoes are very tippy. They rock back and forth. My ancestors, my Chumash ancestors, were used to that. They would paddle and the canoe would lean all the ways over to the right. When they paddle on the left, the canoe would lean over 
uh, to the left. We're relearning our, we're, we are relearning our skills. Uh, so we get a little scared and, and, and uh, when it leans real far like that. So we put ballast or weight in the bottom of the wall. And our, my ancestors would do the same thing. They would just use large rocks between the fishermen or between the paddlers. And as they caught 30, 40 pounds of fish, they would throw some rocks out. So we lined the bottom of our tamal with uh, sandbags for ballast. We put a good 350 uh, pounds of ballast in the 24-foot tamal. That gets some of it underwater, then it's not too tippy, it's more stable. Uh, our paddles, if you can, can see here, th th this is one of our paddles, uh, uh, and uh, they are over 11 feet long. Uh, uh, so we actually kneel on those sandbags uh, when we're paddling and only the captain or the navigator in the, uh, in the back sits down like I'm sitting and he paddles and then uses his paddle as a rudder to get the tumult to turn to the left or the right so that you're going into the waves straight on and not sideways. Um, so we practiced for four years relearning those skills and we felt we were good enough after four years, and in 2001, September 8th, for the first time in over 150 years, possibly maybe even 160 years, uh, a group of Shumash people took a traditional Shumash tamal, a traditional Shumash plank canoe, and we paddled from the mainland out to the island. Uh, and since then, we've gone a dozen more times. And it's something that is very important to the Shumash people because we consider, consider ourselves to be people of the ocean. We are water people. And it is a large part of, of our culture. It's a large part of our way of life. And I tell people all the time, and I'll, I'll, I'll close this section with, with, with this little personal story. Uh, anyone that knows me, my kids, uh, uh, my family know that I have a fear of heights. I don't like being this tall. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm not a daredevil by any means. I'm not an, an, an adrenaline junkie. I like physical challenges, uh, but I like to be on, on stable ground and, and not up too high. Um, but when I get in the tamal and paddle, and I was in that first crew that left at 345, and when we got out of the Channel Islands Harbor, it was pitch black dark. We'd send our support boats several miles ahead of us so we would have an experience paddling at night, uh, paddling in open waters, and it felt perfectly natural. It's one of the things that I enjoy the most is being on the water in, in my traditional ancestral tumul, my traditional ancestral plank canoe. And that's, that's one of the places where I, I feel at home, uh, that it's a, it's a natural thing for me other than when I'm racing someone and that burst of, of when I shift from fourth gear to fifth, fifth gear and I pass them about five yards before the finish line. Other than that, it's one of the best feelings I have. Good morning, my name is Ted Garcia and I'm an elder of the tribe. I'm also a stone carver, I'm a storyteller, a song carrier, a spiritual advisor, and I'm also a chief of the southern band of Chumash Indians. Uh, I've, I'm now part of the uh, Tatav Yam band of uh, the band of Mission Indians because when I first started in my 
quest to find something that pertained to natives and myself, uh, I found the Chumash first and I learned a lot of songs, a lot of ceremony and stuff from them. Uh, and then once that disbanded, I was kind of lost because I was 45 years old when I found the Chumash and when I started getting into my culture. You know, my children had grown up and I had plenty of time to do things for myself. Well, uh, the Chumash program that I was in, it disbanded. And several years later, I heard that uh, uh, <laughs> I can't think of his name. Who's, the, who's our chairman? Rudy. <laughs> I found out that his father had been doing this for many years, trying to get things doing, going, because my, uh, my father was involved in it also. But it was dormant for a long time, but there was still, Rudy was still trying to get you know, get involved, get people involved in this tribe and stuff. And uh, about four years ago, I heard of the Tatav Yam. Well, my lineage goes right through the Tatav Yam. I do have Chumash blood. I do have Tongva blood, Katenamuk, Banyu, Meserano. You know, a little piece of everything. But the most, the most of what I am is Tatav Yam. And then I got involved with that because I wanted to learn about my my own people and uh, ever since then I've gotten involved and uh, I try and do things for the tribe and uh, it's just you know I'm just happy to belong to something because for 45 years I didn't really I had a I had a problem trying to figure out who I was you know I know I walked two paths I knew I was different from a lot of people I had a lot of more intuition and could see things coming that were bad. So I, as a teenager, I always got out of things that were bad because I didn't participate. So uh, once I got involved with the Chumash, I found out that that's why things like that happen. I always had that intuition. I always had that second uh, thought about things. Because I worked, walked the white path for many, many years. I worked 37 years for the Postal Service. I was in the military. And uh, before that, I worked a lot of different jobs before I got drafted. So uh, when I found something that I could really belong to, it, that stuck to me. <clears throat> and about 25 years ago, I had a cousin who was uh, Tongva. He uh, taught me how to do stone carving. And that's what my, one of my fortes. I don't just do storm carving because I've gotten to the age where my hands don't work as good, so I, it's very slow for me now. But uh, anyway, I have some uh, examples of my carvings here today, and uh, I'm going to show you the first one that I ever made. This is uh, confused. I kind of name my, my pieces that I make, and it's a dolphin, but he's also a whale if you look at him from this end. because. It took me eight weeks to do this. And my wife says, I go, here, this is for you. She says, it's a whale. And she says, I don't want a whale, I want a dolphin. So I went back to work and this is what came out. This is a dolphin, but he doesn't know what he is. He thinks he might be a whale too. So this took me about eight weeks because I first started doing this. And the stone that I started working on was probably about this big. And I kept carving and carving and carving and carving. I was ready to throw it up against the wall, but I'm glad I didn't because this is what came up. I participate in the uh, Gene Autry uh, Native American gathering that they have for the artists. And I'm a participant there. And uh, every year it seems like I had something on the table to sell and somebody admired one of my pieces and this one was my father I call him Nixon because his side view kind of looks like Richard Nixon so my father really liked these I really like that bear I really, for two days I heard that you know so nobody bought him so at the end of the you know the end of the program I said okay pop this is for you and so this was his piece
my cousin had a piece like this it was contemporary and he passed so his wife took a lot of his possessions and took them to a consignment store and I bought the other one that looks like this but I wanted to carve my own so this is a swordfish so I call I carved this one My wife also, she, we had a little red-eared turtle in a, in a, uh, in a, uh, an aquarium. And I had a rocking chair next to it that I sat in all the time. She says, I want a, I want a turtle. Well, I'd never carved a turtle before because all the things that I make come from my, what I think a turtle would look like. So this is Maddie. I gave this one to my wife and I never sold it either. I never even put it on my table. But, uh. It, I, it, it's, it means a lot to me. It's very sentimental to me. So. And this one I carved about 15 years ago. And this is a little sea lion or whatever you want to call it. But I uh, carved it about 15 years ago. I set it on my table and year after year people look at it. Ah, okay. They don't. But it got to be, you know, personal with me. It got to be. I started loving it, so I didn't want to give this away. So this sits in my curio along with the other ones. And uh, I made it probably about about 12 years ago. And before, his little fins weren't long enough, so I completely redid it and made his, his arms longer and polished it up, and that's, that's what he looks like. So. Last but not least, and there's not the least to any of these because I've made over 200 of them and I've sold them at at uh, different uh, venues. This is a little seal. I don't know if you can make him out but I carved him and uh, nobody's wanted to buy him either but I made him about five years ago and he's still with me so that's but literally I've served, I've sold hundreds of my, uh, I've been doing it for 25 years, so I, I've, I've sold probably between two and 300. And I've given a lot away too, because when I first started, I didn't think it was right to sell them. So I gave them to friends and family, and I carved buffaloes, in, in, also in uh, bears, and, uh, bears and dolphins and whales were my specialty and then turned into seals. And then uh, I have a stone that uh, I, I brought earlier. It was, a, it was a rabbit, but I should have brought all the finished ones, but I probably should have brought the ones that were in, in progress. But uh, I've carved frogs, uh, swordfish, uh, just a lot of different uh, sea life. And that's what I've done for the last 25 years. It's getting to the point now that I have a, a stack of uh, stone alongside my house. It's about, you know, that I started at the very beginning and I probably got a, a ton of stone. It leans up against my house and every once in a while I get the urge to carve. I'll go out there and one of the stones will talk to me. I'll say, hey, hey, I'm here. So I'll look at it and I'll pick it up and I'll take it to my table and I'll say, oh, what is this? Oh, I know what this will be. It'll be a turtle, or this will be a dolphin, or this will be a sea lion, or you know, etc., etc. Right now, I have about a half a dozen pieces of large stone uh, steatite. It's called. It's a black stone. Uh, that's what the bear <coughs> and that and confused are called. That is made from steatite. But I gather all my own stone up above uh, Bouquet Canyon off a of fire road. There's a lot of stone up there and a lot of different colors and uh, it goes from uh, black to green. Some of them are a little bit tan but the, the, the stone is beautiful. Some of them I've got from Angel's Camp trading with other people and uh, so that's what I've been doing for that for many years. I also make clapper sticks, I also make rattles uh, just because they touch me because when my father turned 80, he kind of complained a little bit because, you know, I'm turning 80 and nobody's planned a barbecue or, 
for a party for me because all his friends who were turning 80 were, were getting parties, you know, big parties in halls and stuff. So uh, we decided we're going to have a big barbecue for him at a park. So I went out and gathered enough elderberry to make over a hundred clapper sticks. And there was over a hundred people at his birthday party. And my brother, my sister, my two cousins, a couple of friends, myself, my girlfriend, and I sat down a couple of weeks before his birthday and carved clapper sticks. And uh, so like I said, I made a few gourd rattles, but I'm not as good with gourd rattles, rattles as I am with uh, the clapper sticks, but I've also made some uh, giant cult, cult bell, cult bell, cult bulb rattles. They're made from a, the cult, the giant cult. <laughs> the giant kelp, excuse me. So, uh, I have several at home that I've made. But, uh, like I said, this is more or less what I started doing uh, in my younger days. But, uh, not so younger days. Between, probably between 46, 47 and to the present. And I'm now 72. I'll be 73 in December. So, <clears throat> Like I said, it's just something that, because I wanted to belong, I wanted to feel the culture, I wanted to take it in, I wanted to be part of the culture and have a sense of belonging. So these things are in addition to what I feel. I'm also a spiritual advisor to, at the uh, Heart of the West powwows in Newhall, and I've been that for about 10 years. And uh, that was funny how I got chosen for that because the gentleman that was uh, the spiritual leader before, uh, he was getting ill and he lived in Minnesota. So he wanted to go home to be near his people before he passed. So uh, I was invited to come to a meeting because they needed a spiritual advisor. And I sat through the whole meeting and waited till someone said, uh, okay, we're, we'll call the meeting. And I said, oh, I guess they don't, didn't think I was a spiritual advisor, which I don't, I don't feel I am, but, you know, just the longevity in my life, I have a lot to say about spiritually and about things that are everyday things. And uh, they says, said to me, uh, could the spiritual advisor please say a closing prayer? prayer? And I said, oh, who's that? And then you, we, you're our spiritual advisor. Oh, okay. So I said a closing prayer, and uh, I'm the spiritual advisor now. Because of COVID, we haven't had a power in a couple of years, but uh, hopefully next year we'll have one. Also with the Audrey, it's been three years, and uh, they said in June of next year they'll start that up again. So the COVID has uh, really stymied a lot of people, you know, the, you know, everyday life and. Uh, Everyday life involves the, the native people also, so. Well, we're back, coming back, and uh, things will be better. And uh, I hope, I hope they'll be better. But uh, we can only hope. It's up to the Creator. And uh, thank you for listening to me. I hope you uh, enjoyed yourself. And uh, see you, Kiwanan. Till we, till we see you again. I hope.